Hello, hello, future perfects. <laughs> That's what I'm calling our audience today. Um, so happy to see everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and let everybody know what's up. We are gonna be with James Lacine today, AKA one of the co-founders of the Future Perfect Project himself. Kind of crazy, kind of amazing. And I'm just gonna let all y'all know. James Lacine on FPP Live. Love it. Pinning this comment. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are the Future Perfect Project. We believe that the artistic expression of young people is a declaration of a better future for us all. Um, we have free arts programming for young people, LGBTQIA plus people and allies ages 13 through 19 and in the fall our fall programming is live in the fall we are going to offer programming for college aged folks and middle school aged folks which is super exciting so there's going to be something for everybody i just got a little follow request for let's let them in can't wait can't wait can't wait and james tells their story best i'm gonna let james tell hello Good I'm so excited. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so excited, excited to be too. live. It's a good feeling to be live, isn't it? And a live. Can you hear me okay? And a live. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh huh. I, I okay, can. Okay. I'm fun. using. Um, James, you are a storyteller. You're an autobiographical storyteller, which is hard to do. Um, would you say that? Would you say you're an autobiographical storyteller? You know what, I, I think that I think that everybody who tells stories is in some way an autobiographical storyteller. Like they're telling, like, even if you tell like a fairy tale and you make it up from scratch, I think you're telling some aspect of yourself. You're revealing something, hopefully. And the closer that story is to something that's true about your own life, um, some emotional truth, I think the, I actually think the further it travels out through time and space, that's my theory. I can't believe we jumped into this so quickly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I was going to do your whole spiel of your bio, but I, I almost think you explain what you do best. I love your aha moment when you were on the road traveling and performing your piece and you had this aha moment performing for young people. And I'm hoping you can speak to what that was. Um, how, when was it? <laughs> Because <laughs> I've been a performer for a long time. Your aha moment when you were doing your one person show with young people yeah. in 2016. So, you know, maybe going back a little bit is a good idea because really it was when I was doing a solo show back in the 20th century um, when you were probably still in high school or even middle school. Um, and I was and I performed Trevor. And that was the first moment um, when I was sort of connected with this, with basically what became my mission, which was to um, really uh, shine a light on young people and in particular LGBT young people. And, you know, before Trevor, there wasn't really this idea of queer youth. Like it was as if people just went away to college and they just became suddenly gay. <laughs> it was like, it, it's a course that was offered or something. And then they came home mm -hmm. and told their parents, but right. um, so I've been working with young people since, you know, like the early 90s, I guess. Um, and then in about 2015, 16, when I was traveling around with my show Absolute Brightness, um, you know, busloads of young people would come to the theater and then I would find my way into the school so I could talk to them. They could talk to me. And I began to notice that there was something completely different about this particular generation of young people and that I'd never seen before. I just like, they were just lit is the, is the short version of it. The longer version is uh, a social justice component, you know, the, the, the phone in their, you know, they grew up with the phone in their hands. So they had all this information and, and they were all connected. Uh, their insistence on diversity and inclusion was so inspiring. And I just thought, well, well, we just got to pay attention to this and like do everything in my power to be able to amplify their voices and also 
which as you know, we do with the Future Perfect Project is to sort of create a pathway from their insides to their outsides, right? So that they can express themselves. And I thought, okay, so we're all good storytellers. That's great. We've all, you know, are doing this out in the world, but like, let's give them the tools that they can actually start to express their vision of the future. And I would ask you, like, what was your aha moment when you started working with these young people? Like when we, when we brought you in and said, Emma Jane, you have to do this with us. And, and then you came on board. And like, what was your, like when you went, oh. I appreciate you letting me answer a question, even though it's your interview. Very generous of you, James. <laughs> um, I was like, unfortunately, a lot of young queer people, even though I wasn't queer yet, was bullied in middle school and called names and when I went into a middle school with you, every young person I saw myself in that I was worried was gonna be bullied was not. There was no social hierarchy that I could tell. And everyone was really just rooting for each other on the same team. And that's when I knew that something was really right. That was my yeah. Yeah. And really you're not that far, like you, what, what was it maybe 10 years ago you were in high school? Yeah, when was I in high school? I started high school in 2010. Yeah, so 10 years ago. Yeah. So, and, and the, the change yeah, that's and happened. And interview you at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but the change that's happened in so, is so quickly and, and also so recent. Um, Absolutely. So I just feel like what we're getting to experience, you know, first traveling around the country for the past two and a half years with, with Ryan Amador, who he was like such an incredible part of the beginning of this with me making this and then you know we brought you on board and and julie and now there's z and we're like becoming a little team and we've been able to pivot this whole thing online during this COVID thing so that young people actually can continue to explore their creativity um in their bedrooms with other young people across the country um, who have similar interests and experiences. I think it's, you know, phenomenal. Personally. I mean, I'm biased, but I do too. <laughs> so now we know kind of what your little, I know you've probably had billions of aha moments um, from how we got from there to here. And I want to rewind and go back to little James because the world was completely different then. I, I knew queer people existed when I was growing up. I lived in Boys Town, which was like queer epicenter of Chicago. What was your life like when you were younger? And did you feel like an absolute alien? What was going on in your head? Um, I didn't know any, like when I was growing up, there was, there were no gay people in my town that were, it, it, gay wasn't even a word except for happy. And um, homosexuality wasn't even, I thought I was the only person in the entire world who had these, uh, strange feelings and crushes on my sister's, old, my older sister's boyfriends. <laughs> and, like, and I thought there was something like kind of different about me. I just thought I was, I thought I was unique. I thought I was truly like a unicorn. And, um, but I never, I didn't feel that there was anything wrong with me. Um, I, because it was love, right? Like, and I knew that like, it, it, it felt good and it was, it was my heart. And it was only later, like when I was beginning to be like 11 or 12, 13, when I started to go, oh my God, this is not okay. Like people were signaling me that this was not okay. And, um, you know, I was just re remembering just recently that there was like a day when I was about 12 years old, when I, I was just inconsolable. I just was sobbing in my bedroom and my whole family, one at a time, they came in trying to console me, but really talk me out of it. And like, what's going on? And, and really what it was, was I realized that I wasn't going to be able to grow up with my full self. Mm -hmm. I was going to have to like leave a part of myself behind. And that my, it just broke my heart. Like it just broke my heart that I wasn't going to be able to be my full and total self. And I think that the impulse to write the story of Trevor and the impulse to create the Future Perfect Project and my impulse to do everything really has been to try to reclaim that lost part of myself 
and not just for me, but because there's so many people and not just queer people, but I think so many people who approach their adolescence and realize like, this is not gonna fly. And so they sort of kind of kill off some part of themselves. And I just, I feel like that's such a loss. I, I just want everybody to reconnect with that part of themselves. That's so beautiful. And I think you've definitely done such an excellent job at helping people find their pieces that they've felt like they had to take off. And are you picking up new pieces today? Well, that's the thing. I think what's been so exciting for me is to be at this stage of my life and to be learning so much from these young people that we work with. And they're, they're sort of teaching me, um, like just recently in a workshop that we did, I, I just decided that day that like, oh, right, I actually relate more to they, them pronouns than to he, him pronouns. And, you know, I sort of came out to everybody in the workshop and they were, I said, but you know, like, I'm old and like, it, you know, and they were like, no, no, you got to do it. You know, like, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm reclaiming that part of myself. Right. And uh, so I, that's incredible to be able to do that at this stage of my life to, to feel brand new and to feel 12 again in some way. Right. So, so they're wonderful. giving me like a big, big gift while we're in the process of giving them um, some tools basically and the support and the space to be creative. And such a good lesson that identities are allowed to change and we're allowed to change no matter how old we are. I, I talked to some of our young people and they're like, well, in fourth grade, I thought I was this. And then in fifth grade, I thought I was this. And I was like, what was I even doing in fourth grade? Like, I didn't even know anything. So it's, it's pretty <laughs> remarkable that they're that in tune with themselves to try and breathe to try different identities and see what feels feels good. And I think that that's really their job, right? Their job is actually actually to show us how thrilling it is to yeah. be able to change and grow and try new things on, right? Like we get into this thing, like once we're adults, we're like, that's who I am. That's what I do. That's my <laughs> title, right? And to be able to have the flexibility and the spontaneity to be able to be yourself at every stage is, I think, such a great gift. That's the best takeaway I've had since being a part of the Future Perfect Project, just like flexibility in terms of identity. You're not, you're not locked in. You're not, you haven't stepped into concrete, you know, like it's open, it's open door. So James, you <laughs> were having crushes on your sister's boyfriends as a young queer bling. And so that's when you had your little I'm different moment. But when did you have your I'm an artist moment? Um, you know, I think that I was always in that sort of headed in that direction. But really, when I entered into high school, um, I had, I was, I, it was just very clear to me, like, I just I went to high school. And everything changed. And I realized that if I didn't find a way to get my insides out, I was just going to implode or something. I just like, I just needed to express that part of myself and, and really find a way to bring my joy, like the joy that was inside me, that was stuck inside me, um, to bring it out so that it would sort of create more joy in other people, like to be able to give that gift. And when I was uh, like 15, I went away, I, I kind of ran away from home uh, to join this uh, theater company uh, on the Jersey Shore. And it was, you know, like 14 musicals, 14 weeks, that kind of thing. You know, it's grueling, grueling schedule, uh, just beautiful, amazing people, all of them queer. And I just found my people. I was just like, oh my God, this is, these are my people. And uh, from that moment, I was, that was it. I was on a trajectory. And even before I knew what I was going towards, obviously I was pulled in that direction um, because I ended up there uh, or I began there, I should say. And mm -hmm. once that happened, that, that was it. Like the theater, it, not only was it a, an incredible place to be able to become other people 
and transform myself into other personas, which I definitely needed to do. Um, <laughs> It also gave me a, a group of people that I could relate to and I felt understood me, even though we might not have had the language of queerness, we had the language of the theater and joy and self-expression, which I thought was important. I'm sure there are young people that are watching this and will be watching this that want and long for that kind of community, um, but are scared to take the first step. What would you, what would you say to them? Because it's scary to call yourself an artist and take, take that big leap into the arts world, I guess, it can be intimidating. Yeah, but you know, I think that especially one of the great things is to be able to, at that age, right? Like at 13, 14, to be able to experiment with art and find out what makes you happy. Like what brings you to that happy place so that you, you know, you, you just, you have to live there. Like you just have to live there. There's just like, no, like, like you're not going to live anywhere else. That's like, but you have to take the first little steps. And, and one thing I would say, which is sort of like a plug for us, but you know, one of the great places to find other young queer people who are interested in self-expression is to come to the future perfect project and do one of our workshops. And, um, just, you know, feel what that feels like to be in a safe space where you can um, try out your own creativity in a non-judgmental and affirming, loving space. It seems like the best kind of people for you to try something new and to be a little unsure. It's, those are the best people to be that with. Yeah, because there are plenty of people who are like, eh, there are plenty of no people out there in the world and we, you get to them eventually. But it's good to have a posse of people and it's good to have um, people that make you feel real. Like who makes you feel real, right? Mm -hmm. And finding those people. Um, and it's weird, it's weird, it's like a chicken and egg thing, right? Like you have to, you have to like, you have to be a little, you have to be real. And then you attract people who actually see your realness, right? Mm -hmm. Completely. So you join this theater troupe for the summer. What happens next? Do you keep creating right away after that? Like you can't stop, you can't get enough? <laughs> yeah, I was just writing about this recently. Yes, I went back to high school, uh, to my um, junior year of high school, and I started the drama club. Okay. Had, there was no drama club in my high school. So I started the drama club and like, I was like, we have to, we have to make theater. And um, and my memory of it, I'm sure, is much more glamorous than it actually was. <laughs> Always. <laughs> and successful. But, you know, it was so fun because I went to like an all boys sports heavy prep school and they had no arts. And I was like, they're going to be arts. And I think it was the beginning of my uh, sort of career as somebody who gets things done and, mm -hmm. who, you know, just says like, no, we're going to do this. OK, you're going to do that. You're going to do that. You're going to. Like, we're just gonna make this happen. And uh, we found, somehow we found the resources to do it and the people to support us. And we made our, we made art. And then I never stopped. I just kept doing it. Once I knew I could talk people into stuff. Right. <laughs> Very convincing person. And, it, and you use your power for good. You brought, you brought a lot of art into the world of boys that maybe wouldn't have had that without you. Yes, and I even got the boys and you know the the sporty boys to sign up to like play unbelievable parts that they never would have like considered in a million years. So thing, did you so have? It's, it's not on my resume, but it, it it's, it's big right. on my. <laughs> it's on your heart. Did you have pushback when you wanted to start the drama club, or was everyone pretty much on board? I think people were so surprised that. Um, they didn't really see it coming and nobody thought it would take off or work. And so um, there was nobody against it. But okay. I, did, I, I did have a, um, a really good art teacher who was totally cool and um, kind of became our sponsor and he, he was great. And I recently connected with him after like decades and decades. <laughs> I haven't been in high school for a long time. And um, I asked him, I said, so what was I like? And he said, oh, you were like so cool. And I was like, no, <laughs> never in a million years did I ever think of myself as cool back then at all, ever. Like, I just felt like the geekiest weirdo ever. But 
you know. I did too. I think I've always felt cool to the teachers. Like there's a lot of funny internet stuff about all these lesbians finding camaraderie and the fact that we all used our English teachers as like our therapist at school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like we all kind of had lunch there, sat in their rooms. We're like, this is my person. Seems like your art teacher was that for you. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really important to find that person, right? When you're at that age to find, to look out and find the person who's going to make you real, who's going to acknowledge your, you know, and, and one of the reasons I reached out to him was to thank him. Mm -hmm. Because he actually saved my life in some way, because he create he gave me the art room to hang out with, in, and he gave me a group of people to hang out with in school. Like I, you know, it was a shelter, and I think it's really important to have those people in school. I feel for young people right now who are not able to be in school, to be able to find those people. Right, mm -hmm. it's it's hard. You, it's hard to find them online. You know, mm -hmm. where, where do you go to find well we're an art room we're, we're an, art an art room yeah and i'm so impressed by all of them finding like i i'm like a weird millennial gen z cusp i guess because i'm really into tiktok and it's insane you could there's something for everyone there there's literally every little type of niche interest and it's wonderful that you don't have to go hunting as hard as you used to to find your people yeah. And, you know, the thing that really impresses me also about this particular generation is their ability to navigate that world, like so expertly, right? Like they, they know when it's kind of shady, they can tell when it's really fun, you know. So you went on to, and you say everybody makes autobiographical art, but you really, you made, you took your story and you turned it into theater. And so I'm wondering... <laughs> Is that hard to do? Was it scary to do? What is that process like? Because it's not as simple as just writing down, here's what's happened to me. You know, it felt at the time, I remember the first time I walked out on stage to do it in New York City. And I, uh, like I was doing a whole show, but Trevor was maybe, you know, 10 minutes of that show. But I was terrified to do it because it felt deeply transgressive. transgressive. Um, like, like I said, you know, queer youth wasn't a thing. People, gay men did not talk about queer young people. Like, it was just like, you don't talk about that. Like, mm -hmm. and yet we all knew that we had these childhoods of being gay, right? And we all knew the cost of that secrecy. And, and the reason I wrote Trevor was because everybody I talked to had, a, had either thought about or attempted suicide when they were in their teens. And I thought, this is crazy. Nobody's talking about this. Um, but that first night I went out there and the, really the first run of the show, every night I went out into the stage and I started performing it. I swear it felt like I was, I know it sounds crazy and hyperbolic, but I was afraid that there was somebody in the audience that was going to shoot me. Like, I just thought like I, someone's going to shoot me dead. Like they're just going to like kill me. It felt that scary. Yeah. But, I, but that's in a way it's how I knew it's like, I felt more alive doing that kind of theater than I did like just doing something like a musical that somebody else wrote. Like, so it became exciting to me to be able to make theater that could make me feel that alive and hopefully make other people kind of wake up a bit and think about something and feel something that they hadn't felt before. You didn't, it sounds like you didn't water down your story at all. You didn't dilute it. And that's why it was so scary. You're like. Well, I made it funny. Well, don't we I, all I, make I, our I, lives it, <laughs> <laughs> I made it funny. So I made it, you know, I, I put a little sweetness in it to make the, to make it go down easier for people. <laughs> so, but my favorite, my favorite moment in my, my life, really, one of my favorite moments was to having achieved this moment in the, the in performing Trevor in which he's actually taking the pills and attempting suicide and lip syncing to Diana Ross, singing <laughs> Endless Love at the same time. And the, I, the, 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 the juxtaposition of the tears and the laughter from the audience was like truly like one of the most beautiful things you can hope for in a theater is where, when they're happening almost at the same time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's almost like, 
that was such a way for you to reclaim the pieces you didn't get to be so open about when you were younger. You put yes. them on stage. Yes, and I, and I put it out into the light so that other people could see themselves reflected in it. And then when the film got made, you know, um, then people really like it just, you know, so many people were able to relate to Trevor and not just queer people, like really like just young people, everybody, everybody feels um, like an outsider or, you know, feels like they're, they're not going to make it at some point in their adolescent years. And I just, Completely. You know, I just really feel like we all, that's the moment we all need to, to let young people know that we're here for you and we see you, you know, and we honor your struggle of being, you know, an adolescent or a teenager, which is like w one of the most awesome struggles in our, that you'll face in your life. Completely. Making yourself into a person. I have a teenage sister and I remember the movie Eighth Grade. Did you ever see that movie? Oh, I love that movie. Wonderful, but also a little triggering. I was like, oh, I was this. I was scared to be in a swimsuit at the pool party. And there was a Q&A with the actors after, and I was like, what, what do I do for my eighth grade sister? And they were like, she wants space. She wa she's like figuring it out. Just leave her alone. And I was like, oh, what? And that's, I think back in like, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be with my people. No yeah. one understood me. And so you really like, it wasn't only medicine for you when you put that out, James, but it was medicine for so many people who were finally like, I'm understood, I've, I've been gotten. And that's so wonderful that you did that. And it led to the Trevor Project, right? Right, I was gonna like, get there. <laughs> I mean, that's what's so, to me, that's what's so miraculous about it, is that art can be actually used as a form of activism. Artivism, how do you pronounce Artivism. 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 Yeah, I didn't make that up. I was up, like but... practicing how to say it in the mirror. I was like, artivism. Artivism. What a beautiful word. Talk, talk about artivism. Is that, is that your main mission with all the art you make? You know, I just want, I just want to be a really good storyteller. I just want to tell really good stories that people really love. The fact that a story can actually change the outcome of a cultural story or a socioeconomic problem or or a, you know, something like, like the, like, like suicide among young people, like that, that could actually change the ending. You know, like, I just always think that before the Trevor Project, it was just a sad story. You know, young LGBT people were three to four times more likely to attempt suicide in their, in teenage years. And that just seemed crazy. And there was no, there was no resolution other than, oh, that's sad. And I think what happened was that the creation of the Trevor Project created an alternative ending to that to that cultural story, mm -hmm. it, it, and and it's it has the potential to be a happy ending, um, and and one that I don't know, just one that like really needs to be in the world. Like we just need more people in the world who are going to live their full lives. Completely, and you kind of you saw what almost happened to you. you. You couldn't imagine yourself growing up when you were a young queer person. And so to give people that hope is so amazing. How, when was like, um, when was that moment? I keep focusing in on moments and as queer people, yeah. we know that there's no black and white. It's like many moments, many, many times. But I wanna hear about that shift from this really sad, but also humorous and joyful theater piece you made to the Trevor Project to this platform that helps people through a hotline and now a chat room and now like a social media platform rather than them having to go see your theater piece to kind of get that medicine. Yeah, um, you know, it was a it was a long process. Um, and not a I, moment. <laughs> and not a moment, but there was a moment when um, two people, Randy uh, Stone, who was the producer of the Trevor film and uh, Peggy Reisky, who was the director and the producer, they came to see the show in New York City and they contacted me afterwards and asked me if I would um, adapt Trevor into a, a short film. And uh, they were so sweet when they had to tell me that I would not be playing the part of the 13 year old, <laughs> that we would actually have a 13 year old. You're like, what? I was like, wait a minute, hold on. That seems like a total tip. <laughs> um, so I was just, uh, 
I thought, okay, I can, you know, I never even thought like, could I even write a screenplay? I'd never done that before, but I thought, okay, yeah, I could do that. And so oh. I, I wrote the screenplay, we raised the money and then the film happened and just incredibly, it won an Academy Award, which was such a complete uh, miracle. Um, I call it a miracle. Randy and Peggy said it was like part of the strategy. Right. <laughs> You're and like, well, um, no, we, we meant for this to happen. Thanks, Jane. And then, you know, a couple of years later, we made arrangements with HBO to put it on the tel on television. Um, and we just thought that there would be young people out there who would recognize themselves in the character of Trevor. And so Peggy suggested that we put a telephone number at the end of the film. And there was no 24 hour suicide prevention lifeline specifically for um, gay and lesbian young people. So in three months, we raised the money and um, st you know, trained people, uh, partnered with a already existing uh, lifeline. And that first night, uh, over 1,500 telephone calls came that first night. Wow. Not all of them in crisis, but all of them relating to the film and enough to be able to give us the information that this was something that needed to happen. Um, right. And that was 23 years ago. Amazing. Incredible. And it's so incredible that instead of saying, oh, there's no number for that. So let's just scrap that idea. Let's just not put a number at the end. You said, we're going to make a number. <laughs> yeah. So amazing. It, we didn't know how hard it would be. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, let's do it. Well, how do you take care of yourself when you're making huge social change like that, balancing your life as an activist and an artist? And how do you take care of yourself in that process? I think being with people who, who know me and love me and see me for who I am is really helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, the natural world is like the greatest tonic ever. I think it was invented for us to be able to just be in it and um, instantly be made right sized, right? Like you just, you get out in nature and like, you know, oh yeah, this is the right size. Uh, I'm the right size, right? And um, it just feels like that's the right place to be. So those are, those are two people and nature, not that people aren't a part of nature, but. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's all nature. When you're not, when you can't be in nature, nature, sometimes people have to be your, your trees and your. Yeah, your human nature. And also, yeah. you know, I think um, craft, crafting things, whether it's, you know, drawing or making gifts for people and stuff like things like doing things with my hands that are made with love and don't have a um, capitalist trajectory. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're, they're just things that I love to make because they delight me and hopefully they delight the person I'm, uh, I'm giving them to. That to me is, uh, is such a form of self care because it sort of turns off a, a kind of something in my brain. Yes. Turns on something else. I love making art for the sake of art. That's such an important lesson. I think all of us raised in this society think like, oh, I have to make money from it or else it's not worth it. Or it, it has to be liked by a million people or it's not valid. <laughs> Right when some of the most precious things that I've made have only gone to one person, and you know I know that they're living with it, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of their life. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you earlier because you've been fortunate enough to have audiences for a lot of the art you make, but an audience isn't necessary to be an artist, is it? No, uh, no absolutely not. But I think eventually one. I, I'll, I'll speak for myself being the one. Um, I think eventually I want to delight people. I want people to, I, I just want to, I just want people to be delighted. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I want them to think and feel things that, that, and, and I want them to cry. And I, okay. <laughs> I want them to laugh and to cry. I, the thing that I like is making things. And then even if I just give it to one person, to be able to see their response. And the two responses I like the best are when people cry <laughs> and, when they, and, and when they laugh, because both of them are completely involuntary. You mm -hmm. cannot 
like, you, you, you know, I mean, you, you, you can fake laugh and you can fake cry, but like crying and, and laughing are just like, so they're just, they're just so beautiful. A, a part of our expression as human beings. So I like to make that happen. <laughs> Love it. Love it. We have a question from one of our viewers. What? What have you learned from young people that has helped you the most? Um, for a second. Yeah, not. you froze, but you're back. Um, I've never learned so much about courage um, from anybody that, as I have uh, watching the young people in the past three years and watching them be themselves and in the face often of like incredible pushback and their, their courage has really inspired me. And it's, it's inspired me not only to be more myself, but also to do more to make sure that they have every resource available to them to continue to be themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, what are some of those resources in your mind other than what we do for them or including what we do for them? Well, you know, one of the things we did recently was we did this incredible outreach to find young people to bring them, especially for the summer programs that we designed. And I was so blown away by all of the LGBT centers all across America. Like we did a, like a massive spreadsheet with them all. And I was like, oh my God, this is an amazing thing. And then we tried to figure out how many of them had resources for young people. And I would say it was mm, less than a third. Really? So they were mostly adults? Yeah, they're, 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 you know, that's where most of the resources are, right? For adults and um, like mental health things, which are great and they're important and they're, you know, art things. But I would like to see every LGBT youth center in this country really make sure that their young people are taken care of and protected, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to like, you know, we'll get to that. Like, and I, and because the ones who are, I just think, that they are doing like such beautiful work in protecting in, in, in protecting queer youth. Yes. I need that <laughs> shirt. I need that shirt. Um, are you living James in a future that has not yet arrived? At yes. This moment? Yes, I am. You know why? Because I spend so much time with these young people. And so I'm actually like, I can't see it, but they, with their 2020 vision, they can see it. And so I like, I'm, I'm going like, tell me more, tell me more. Um, and I think, as you know, one of the things that we do is we often do these workshops where we actually ask them to tell us what their future looks like and mm -hmm. what does this future world look like? And it's, it's, it's an awesome, it's an awesome, and they're, they seem prepared and ready to um, make it happen. So I just want to make sure they have every resource to be able to make that future happen. Mm hmm completely. And what's your perfect future? Uh, my perfect future is that these young people actually grow into a world in which they are someday, they're able to tell their grandchildren, this was the turning point in the life of the world. And this was, and they were a part of it, that they mm -hmm. made it happen, right? That they, because of who they were and how how, how, quite, how, quite frankly, how brave they were to be themselves, that it actually changed the way the world was, was headed, the direction of the world. How's that? For, how's that, that for a good <laughs> Obviously gorgeous. I love it. I'm wondering, there are a lot of people that don't have the vocabulary around queerness or might be intimidated, whether they're a part of the community or not. What is something you wish you had as a young, not out queer person that someone today could give a queer person in their life? You know, I think one of the things that's also so impressive, people always ask me, aren't there too many genders now? Or aren't there too many <laughs> options of, you know, sexual orientation? Like, well, there are too many things. Aren't we supposed to be like becoming like more together? Like, how can we, if there's so many choices, but I find it really astonishing 
that the queer community is this beautiful umbrella that is teaching people how to get along with difference, right? Mm -hmm. So like where I, when I was, you know, when, when I was in my twenties and stuff, like lesbians were over there and the gays were over there and the bisexuals were not invited to the party. And, you know, the transgender people were like over the, over, over there. And now it's like, it's just, there's a, it's a beautiful umbrella, right? A rainbow umbrella that really is insistent on inclusion. So in answer to your question, like if you don't have the language, that's fine. Nobody really expects you to have the language. The language is changing all the time. Right. And we don't know the, I don't know, like I'm constantly surprised in learning new things, right? And, but there's such acceptance for difference and diversity and, and uniqueness to allow each person to develop in the way that's right for them. So it's kind of just like get on board with that to help, to help your queer people and your queer friends, right? Yeah, yeah, and join in and find out like who you are. What color of the rainbow you are. You are such, I love how, at oh, first- Oh, Jared I like, is here. My, Jared Lucene is here. Oh my gosh. He's, he's, he's my, in my family pod. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hi, family pod. Hi, Jared. Um, Jared, you're a little late, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> and I was gonna, my last question, because I remember talking, I was like, these things run long because we just have so much fun. Hello, Uncle James, says Jared. Oh, um, that's nice. You are someone who says anybody can be queer. And at first I was a gatekeeper and I was like, only I get to be queer, only the gay people get to be queer. What is your definition of queerness? Cause it, mine is changing from being around you. And what does it mean to you? You know, I think anybody who feels like an ally to, you know, people who are LGBTQIA, anybody who is really willing to um, say, yes to, to those people and say, it, it, you know, be who you are. That's helpful. That's an ally. But I think that if you feel like you don't really fit into the norm and you, um, you, you just want to explore your, your uniqueness, right? Like, um, I just remember being once in a high school in the middle, literally in the middle of a cornfield, literally in Indiana. Literally. And there was a boy in that, in the, the GSA, the, you know, the, the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. And he said, you know, I, I identify as, um, as heterosexual, but I feel more comfortable here with these people. These are, I feel like these are my people because they're, they're free. And I think as you and I know, when we go into a school and there's a mixed population, when we're doing this work through the lens of, through a queer lens, it allows the young straight people to feel more free. Mm -hmm. Like they just feel like, wait a minute, I just feel more myself. Right. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm a lot looser with the word queer because I think it's anybody who really wants to try on their uniqueness and is willing to find out who they are without having to subscribe to the norm. Well, what a beautiful way to close our chat, James. I Oh, so I love this. Beautiful. This was so fun. We should do so this fun. like every night. <laughs> it's, I know, right? We should have a podcast. It's so crazy that we can just like have a conversation and people watch and enjoy it. I'm like, we're just talking. Wait, people are watching? People are watching. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, let me tell you what we've got going on this week, James, before, yeah, yeah. before we say goodbye to summer and then we come back for fall October 5th, I believe. Yes. Let me look at my calendar. Yes, we're going to take October the month 5th. of September off because we're giving people, young people, an opportunity to acclimate themselves to high school and being online and doing all that. Mm -hmm. Right. So this week, we are not doing our usual future perfect online workshop, but we do have office hours with you and Julie Novak ahead of a FPP FPOW slam this Friday, which is going to be so amazing. Just a chance for young people to share their art. Yeah. Um, 
kind of a live audience on YouTube. Yeah, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. And if you are like, oh my gosh, I want to perform so badly, email us or DM us on Instagram. And if you're like, I wanna perform so badly, but I would love James or Julie, amazing writers and storytellers to take a quick look at my piece, just send us an email or send us a DM. We're here for you. This week is for you to kind of get those pieces ready. And on Wednesday for our Queer Song Exploders, we're gonna teach you how to produce your own music at home from two amazing queer producers. Amazing week to close out our summer and don't forget to sign up for our fall programming, which starts in October. You're going to miss us when we're gone, but you I'm get used miss to you. school. You get used to school. We'll be here getting fall ready for you. I'm going to miss you, James, when we're on our little fall Yeah, break. but we're going to be in touch. We're going to be in touch. We'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. I love you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, everybody, for watching and, um, you know, be safe, be yourself. I'm not even going to say anything else because that was great. Good night, everybody.